welcome to another STAT 437 lecture video. In today's lecture, what I want to do is take a look at some examples of GEEs. So in the last lecture, we discussed how we can use generalized estimating equations to estimate the parameters for a generalized linear marginal model. And in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're just going to look at for the sort of the three common cases of data that we might be looking at, what do those estimating equations actually look like? How would we go about estimating the parameters in those models? And sort of how do we set up that problem? Now, in actual fact, just like with GLMs, we're generally not going to be able to get closed form estimators for these parameters. And so we're going to sort of set up the problems and then uh, sort of in practice, you're going to be using numerical estimation techniques to accomplish the actual parameter estimates. So with that, I'll open up the whiteboard here. And you can see that we're sort of pulled up our first example already. So the first example that we want to look at is what we do when we have continuous longitudinal data with the identity link function. Okay, so if you remember back to when we were talking about linear marginal models, this was for continuous longitudinal data and we used an identity link function. But the key difference between using generalized estimating equations, so our approach right now, and what we have been talking about prior to learning generalized linear marginal models is that in a linear marginal model, we assumed or we assumed multivariate normality, right? So that normal assumption is going to be sort of the key differentiating uh, factor between when we're using continuous longitudinal data estimated via generalized estimating equations, or GEEs, and when we're doing it through that normality assumption. Okay, so how could we go about um, sort of setting this up? Well, to remind you what we're going to be looking at today, the general form for this generalized estimating equation, or this GEE, is going to be an estimating equation, uh, we'll call it U of beta, and we're going to take the summation over a sample, an IID sample, I equals 1 to n, and we're going to have uh, di transpose, vi inverse, and then this multiplies by, and I'll write this as yi minus mu i, okay? And so here, to clarify, di, well, this is going to be a matrix that has derivatives in it. So it's going to be the derivative of mu i with respect to the parameter we care about, beta. Vi, well, this is our working covariance matrix. Or, um, and so that's going to be, generally speaking of this form, uh, the square root of a times by ri times by the square root of a, right? If we are willing to assume that um, we sort of have constant variance across the different time points, we might also sort of think of this as sigma squared times ri. And remember, ri here is a correlation matrix. And so that's whatever correlation structure we're assuming. And then finally, over here, we have mu, which is going to be given by uh, the inverse link function applied to our linear predictor. So that's xi beta. And so remember that we say that in this model, uh, g of mu i is equal to xi beta, where g is going to be our link function, right? So if we're working with binomial data, it's going to be the logit link. If we're working with count data, it's probably going to be a log link, right? And so then to get our mean, we invert g. So we take the inverse of g, mu i is equal to g inverse xi beta. Right, so this is the general setup that we're working with. And so for this particular example, well, what we're saying is that yi is going to be continuous and that we have uh, the identity link function. So g of mu i is just going to equal mu i, which is going to equal xi beta. Okay. And so how can we go about specifying a generalized estimating equation for this? Well, the components that we need are the link function, which we've already given right there. We need to write down our linear predictor, which we're saying is xi beta. We need to specify a variance function, okay? So remember that we're assuming that our variance is going to be given by 
phi times by some variance function, which is a function of the mean. And the way that we're going to choose this in practice tends to be based on sort of the inspired distribution. So what I mean by that is that continuous data, we're taking inspiration from this normal distribution. And in the normal distribution, this variance function is given by the constant. So it's equal to one, right? And that's just because in a normal distribution, we know that we just have constant variance. We normally write it as sigma squared, but you can also write it as this phi parameter here. And so we take the variance function to be equal to one. So what that means is that um, we're going to assume that mu ij is going to be equal to xij transpose beta. We're going to assume that uh, phi times by the variance function of mu ij is just going to equal phi. Okay. We can take our R matrix to be sort of anything that we want it to be, right? So we could make the exchangeable assumption. We could make an autoregressive assumption. For this whole lecture, I'm just going to assume an unstructured correlation matrix because it doesn't really end up making a big difference for what we're writing down here. It's going to make a bigger difference when we're actually looking at the code in uh, the coming weeks. Okay, so with all of that, we want to write down what is u of beta. Okay, so in order to do that, we need to figure out what di is. So remember, di is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to beta of mu i. So in this case, mu i is going to just be, um, so this will be the derivative with respect to beta of x i beta. And if you remember from your multivariate uh, calculus course, this is going to equal x i. And so, in this situation of the uh, linear continuous longitudinal data with the linear link function, we find that our derivative matrix is just equal to the matrix of variates that we're using. Okay. And so then what we can do here is actually write down u of beta directly, right? So we have u of beta is going to equal the summation of i equals one to n. And then we take di transpose vi inverse yi minus mu i. Okay, and now we can just plug in our values for this. So we found that di is going to equal xi. So we're going to start with xi transpose. Now our variance matrix, well, that's given by the, um, the, the variance matrix is given based on, uh, where do we have this written down here? We have this uh, general form up here. Um, and that's going to be specified based on this variance function that we have, right? So we're saying that for every individual, the uh, variance function is just equal to one. And so what that means is that the overall variance is going to be uh, sort of phi times by ri rho, okay? Because we're not assuming any sort of particular variance structure there. So we can write that in as phi times by ri of rho. And again, note that we're just leaving the correlation matrix unstructured here. We're going to take the inverse of that. And then yi, in this case, mu i is just equal to xi beta. And if you really want, you can see that we can actually end up factoring out this phi inverse term. So this is going to work out to be phi inverse, the sum from i equals 1 to n, xi transpose ri of rho inverse yi minus xi beta. Okay. And this estimating equation right here, so what we would end up doing is we would solve u of beta hat equals zero. And whatever beta hat happens to be is going to be our estimator. Now, if you notice, this is actually uh, sort of exactly the estimator that we've already been working with. Okay. And so that's sort of not a coincidence. You could work out exactly why that is, but that's nice to know that the same set of estimating equations can be interpreted either based on the assumption of normality, or they can be derived through this generalized estimating equations approach, which is sort of what we saw in the standard linear regression case as well. Okay. But so that's the linear case. Um, let's continue on to sort of a more interesting example here, and that's using binary longitudinal data. Okay. So if we think about uh, binary data in the non-longitudinal setting, right? 
So we're thinking of our outcome, say y, is going to equal either 1 or 0, right? And then if we want to model the expected value of y given x, that's the probability that y equals 1 given x, right? And so normally we would think to use logistic regression here. And so to specify a logistic regression model, well, we're going to say that um, the, the mean is equal to uh, the probability, and we would typically use the logit link function, right? So we're going to say that uh, g of mu, and we'll just keep working in the situation where we're assuming this is univariate for a second here, g of mu is typically going to be the logistic link function, which is uh, the log of mu divided by 1 minus mu, and we're going to set that equal to uh, x transpose beta, say, right? And so then if you wanted to invert this, we could find that mu is equal to, uh, and this is going to be the inverse logistic function or the x-bit function. Uh, there's a couple of different names for it, but there's sort of two general forms that it takes on. You can either write this as e to the x transpose beta divided by one plus e to the x transpose beta. Uh, and this is equivalently uh, one plus e to the negative x transpose beta, uh, to inverse, so one over that expression, okay? And so that's going to be sort of our mean relationship. Now with binary data, we typically uh, take the variance function, so v of mu, if we're assuming a binomial distribution, is going to be mu times one minus mu, right? And so we can do the same thing sort of in this setting. Uh, and that's going to be sort of the canonical specification for a logistic regression model. And so if we want to generalize this out, we can take these uh, same specifications here, except now we're dealing with uh, sort of these longitudinal terms. So what that means is that we're taking log of say mu ij over one minus mu ij is equal to uh, x ij transpose beta, right? And so then mu ij by the same argument is going to be equal to uh, and I'm just going to write this function here. I'm going to express this as the x bit of x transpose beta. Okay. So then mu ij is going to be equal to the x bit of x ij transpose beta. Right. Um, we can take the same general process for our variance function. And if we're doing that, well, then here each term actually does have a meaningful variance. It's not going to be constant variance, right? And so we will end up wanting this AI matrix, right? So we can say that um, the AI matrix is going to be the variance uh, terms for each individual, right? And uh, this is going to be sort of a um, K by K matrix here, right? And each of these is going to have a mu IJ times one minus mu IJ on the diagonal. And so I guess I should fill that in more correctly. In this case, it's going to be mu i1, 1 minus mu i1. And then it's going to be zeros on everything else, right? And so then we'd have a zero, and then we'd have mu i2, 1 minus mu i2, more zeros. Uh, so if we continue this all the way down, it's going to be a zero, zero. And the last term here is going to be, say, mu i k, 1 minus mu i k, right? And then what this means is that if we take a i to be uh, this, this expression here, then what we're saying is that our variance function is going to be phi times by a i uh, to the 1 half, r i, where we can leave this to be an unstructured correlation matrix if we want, or we could impose some pattern, but there's no need to do that, times by a i inverse, or a i to the one half, right? And so um, here we have our uh, mean specification with our link function, we have our variance specification, and so from that mean specification, we can try to work out what is our d i matrix. So d i, recall, it's the derivative with respect to beta, of mu i. And now in this case, mu i is going to be a vector, uh, a very clear vector, right? So there's not going to be quite as easy of a simplification. But each element of mu i is going to be given by x bit of, uh, say, 
xi1 transpose beta, and then we go all the way down to the x fit of xik transpose beta. Okay, so we have to take the derivative with respect to beta of this vector here. Now, remember that what that's going to mean is each row is going to be the derivative of the particular term with respect to beta, right? And so we're going to end up with a matrix where we sort of differentiated within the rows. And if you actually take the derivative of any one of these terms, right? Um, so if you take the derivative with respect to, say, beta j, uh, I'm going to say beta l, actually, of x fit of x i j transpose beta. So what you're thinking of this is this is going to be the lths column from the jth row of this derivative matrix that we're working out here. Well, you can actually work out based on just this form up here for what the x fit actually is that the derivative here is going to be given by um, x i j and then we multiply that by uh, this expression, which is uh, going to be the x fit of x i j transpose beta um, times by the uh, 1 minus the x fit of x i j transpose beta. And um, I'm realizing right now that I've actually missed off a, a subscript here. So this should be x i j l, right? Because we're just looking at one of the one of the columns. So the specifics of this uh, are included in the note online, but it, all it is is sort of this rote calculus procedure where we differentiate each one of these terms with respect to beta. And the sort of the punchline for that is that we can write this x bit of x i j beta as mu ij. And so then 1 minus that term is going to be times 1 minus mu ij, right? And so then the derivative, if we take all of this and we sort of put this into our di matrix, is then going to be equal to a bunch of terms where in each row we have a sort of mu i1 times by 1 minus mu i1 times by uh, and then here, the way that I'll write this, I suppose, is uh, say x i1 transpose. And then we would have mu i2, 1 minus mu i2, x i2 transpose, and so on, up to mu i k, minus mu i k, x i k transpose. And so this is going to be uh, sort of rows where each of these terms is this mean times 1 minus the mean times by each component of the x vector for that row. Okay, so again, I would just take a peek at how do we get this actual derivative out of there and then make sure you understand plugging that into the matrix. But once we have that di matrix here, um, there's sort of this handy way that we can express it where if you notice that each one of these uh, di uh, terms is going to be actually the sort of corresponding term out of um, the AI matrix, right? And so ultimately what we're going to be able to do is use the fact uh, that we have this AI matrix right here. And so we can write DI is equal to uh, AI times by XI, okay? And so that sort of gives us this nice simplification where we can now come in and plug into this U of beta Remember u of beta is the sum from i equals 1 to n of di transpose vi inverse uh, vi inverse yi minus mu i. And now we can just fill this in once more. So this is going to be the sum from i equals 1 to n. di transpose, well, that's going to be xi transpose ai transpose. We said that vi is going to be equal to phi times by ai to the 1 half times by ri times by ai to the 1 half. We invert that matrix there. And then we take yi minus mu i. Mu i, in this case, is going to be the x bit of 
xi beta. Okay, and so this here works out to be the estimating equation when we make the assumptions corresponding to a logistic regression in the case of longitudinal data, right? So there's a little bit more calculus involved there. The details aren't actually super important because ultimately we're going to be using a computer to analyze all of this. But, uh, you know, I would encourage you to work through those details to see if you can sort of see where everything is coming from. Okay, so with that example out of the way, we'll move on to sort of the third and final major example, and that's longitudinal count data, right? So if we remember, uh, when we're faced with count data in the univariate case, we're typically going to assume that it's Poisson and run a Poisson regression with the log link function, right? So in this case, what we would be saying is that log of mu i j is equal to x i j beta, right? And so of course that means that mu i j is equal to e to the x i j beta. Right, so that's sort of the standard log link. Now, in a Poisson uh, regression, or in the Poisson random variable, generally speaking, we assume that the variance function is equal to the mean, right? So v of mu ij is just equal to mu ij. And so in this case, you know, you could also write in this relationship uh, down here as well, if you wanted to, right? So you could bring that in directly. Now, if um, we sort of pull this together into what our VI matrix is then going to be, right? Uh, so we would have that uh, VI is going to be, once again, phi, oops, phi times by AI to the one half, times by RI, times by AI to the one half. And the AI matrix is just a diagonal matrix, which has the variance along the diagonal. So in this case, AI is simply going to be the matrix that has mu1, mu2, down to mu k, and it's going to be zeros elsewhere, okay? And so uh, we could also simply write this matrix as uh, sort of the diagonal matrix that's given by uh, the diagonal matrix that's given by uh, e to the xi beta, right? And so uh, that's sort of what our AI is going to be. And then again, with our correlation matrix, we can plug in whatever we want for that, right? So leaving it unstructured is perfectly reasonable. But if there's some reason to expect a particular pattern, we can do that as well. So then what we're left with is trying to compute what di is. Remember once more that di is going to be the derivative with respect to beta of mu i. In this case, mu i is once again a vector, so it's going to be the derivative with respect to beta, and each component of mu i is going to be equal to e to the um, x i, say, 1 beta, and we can go down to e to the x i k beta. All right, and so these are actually slightly easier to differentiate directly as compared to when this is an x bit function, right? And so, um, each of these rows is going to sort of keep the form of e to the x i 1 beta, right? Because that doesn't uh, change anything when you use the exponential function. But then we have to multiply it by the derivative of what's in the exponent there. And that's going to give us, say, x i 1 transpose. And then that's going to be down to uh, x i k beta. And then that would be x i k transpose. Okay, so once again, we're looking at this matrix where each of these rows takes the form of the mean times by each component of our x matrix, right? And so we can sort of, once again, if we wanted to, we could factor this out into uh, our x matrix and the matrix corresponding to our mean, right? Um, so in particular, this is going to be equal to um, the matrix for our mean, say, AI. Right, because in this case, AI is exactly our mean times by XI, okay? So we were able to make that factorization there. And so using that, we're gonna take U of beta is equal to the sum from I equals one to N of DI transpose VI inverse YI minus mu I 
hopefully this is all becoming quite familiar. Now we plug in the values here, right? So we found that di is gonna be given by ai times xi. So that's gonna be xi transpose ai transpose. vi is phi times by ai to the one half, ri ai to the one half. And then we take yi minus mu i. Well, mu i in this case is uh, the exponential of xi transpose or xi beta. Okay, and so then once again, where you would solve u of beta hat equals zero, and that would give us our GE estimator for uh, this particular situation. So that's essentially everything that I wanted to discuss in these examples today. I go through these in sort of more detail, explicitly working through every step of these calculations in the notes posted on Learn. So I'd advise you to check those out if you can't do the derivation yourself or if you sort of get stuck on a point. The only other piece that I would like to sort of bring back to your attention, and that's with regards to this count data. So we're going to see an example of this actually done in R in uh, the coming lectures. but. Remember that when we're using count data, we also need to be considering our offsets, right? And so maybe if I pop back over, pull the whiteboard back up for a second here. Well, if you remember that um, what we're really doing is we are saying that uh, we have events coming at some rate, and we normally would call that rate, say, lambda i, right? And so uh, in the standard GLM case, we would say that the expected value of yi given xi, um, it's going to be some, some rate of uh, lambda, but we're going to multiply that by the sort of time that we had offset, right? And so this is going to be uh, the, the number of events that we would expect to come in is going to be the rate at which they come in times by the time uh, that they are exposed for, right? And so, um, you know, if you have one bus stop that you're observing for 10 hours and another bus stop that you only observe for five hours, even if they were at the same rate, you would expect that there are twice as many at the bus stop observed for 10 hours compared to the one observed for five hours, right? And so the way that we would end up accomplishing this is by setting sort of an offset uh, where we take the log of our time here. And so sort of put differently, um, we might actually want to specify in the Poisson model log of mu ij is going to be equal to uh, xij transpose beta. And this here is capturing the actual rate that they come at. And then onto that, we might add a log offset. And so maybe I'll call that uh, log delta t, okay? Or delta t, and I'll call it delta tij. Specify it's for the ith j individual, right? Where what this now means is that we take mu ij, it's gonna be the exponential of both sides, Right, so that's going to be e to the xij transpose beta. And then we multiply that by delta tij. Right? And so now, if this is uh, sort of the expected rate, then we multiply that in through the time. And so we'll see this again when we actually fit these models in R. But just as a reminder, um, we might not be specifying the log link exactly as I had it worded above. But the math doesn't actually change at all. This won't impact the derivatives, it will just be sort of a term to carry around when you're doing those calculations. So as always, if you have any questions with anything we've talked about, please do let me know. And otherwise, I will see you in the next lecture video.